Good afternoon, good morning, good day, whatever it is. Welcome to Talking Man with a Bowtie Boy. I'm Tom Saviello, and I have my great friend, Dr. Nalaboff. Always, always say, a pleasure. Always good always to have you here. Always a pleasure to have you here. He cooks breakfast every once in a while. He's old and retired like I am. But he's got a special project that he's working on, and what I thought was really important that we talk about that today. And, and so why don't you describe the project, and then I can go on from and ask some questions about this, because... Uh, drug overdoses is huge still. I mean, we've, with COVID-19, we've kind of lost sight of that, and it's time we got to back focusing on that. Yeah, and, and certainly the pandemic um, is a huge stressor for people who were either using drugs or had the potential to use drugs. And uh, we know that drug overdose deaths in Maine were the same as the pandemic deaths in, in uh, 2020. There were 100 people who lost their lives uh, the first two months of 2021 due to drug overdose. So really? this is an ongoing problem that, if anything, has been made worse by the pandemic. So, so let's just step back for a minute. It's heroin. Or it started with the oxycodones and so forth in some part. But now heroin has come up as the quote-unquote cheap alternative. It, how does that work in the body? What does that do for this? How does it create this euphoria? Right. Well, opioids in general, which uh, oxycontin, oxycodone, uh, heroin, morphine, fentanyl, they all sort of work the same way. They act, um, they cause a euphoria and they depress various bodily functions. And the most important one is your uh, breathing function. The respiratory center is, um, is suppressed so you just forget to breathe. You just don't breathe. And that's what kills people is, is uh, lack of oxygen. And then fentanyl becomes kind of the spike in this stuff that's really yeah. nasty. Yeah, actually, um, only about 10% of overdose deaths now are associated with heroin. And I think 68% are associated with fentanyl. And most of the fentanyl isn't from hospitals or hospital pharmacies. It's illegally uh, manufactured fentanyl, mostly from China, gets smuggled into this country by the Mexican cartels and then distributed. And a big problem is that people who use drugs don't know what they're taking. They, they may think they're taking heroin or something, but most uh, of it is laced with fentanyl. Fentanyl is 50 times more potent than, uh, morph than, uh, than morphine or heroin. And um, uh, it's even people who think they're using amphetamines, for example, usually fentanyl is mixed in with it. So that's the biggest cause of, uh, biggest single cause of overdose deaths. And fentanyl does the same thing? It paralyzes the breathing muscles? It does the same thing, but it, it actually, it doesn't paralyze, but it suppresses the centers in your brain that make you want to breathe. Wow. So, um, and it's, fi again, 50 times more powerful than, than heroin. And fentanyl in a hospital setting is actually used as a sedative, is that correct? It's, it's used as a short-acting, uh, pain reliever for people who are um, usually under anesthesia. So you've got someone monitoring your, your oxygen levels and taking care of the breathing. And, um, uh, but, you know, people who are using it out in the community don't have that. So you've got a project that you're working on um, that to address, and, and you're, you're a do baby doctor, basically. It used to be, yeah. Used to be. Yeah. And so you understand a lot about postpartum depression. You understand the delivery process. Um, fortunately, you didn't deliver me because I was hatched. You didn't know that. And you way. couldn't blame me for I couldn't any blame problems you for that, that you're you know, having you, now. You, right? you, it wasn't you that dropped me <laughs> on my head when I was born. It was Dr. Van Wyk, okay. uh, who I got to know later in life. But yeah. So tell me about the project you've got. So first of all, I'm a member of the PQC for me the Perinatal Quality Collaborative for Maine. And it's a group of us, uh, physicians, uh, midwives, nurses, uh, pediatrics, OB. And uh, what we do is develop quality projects to, to decrease um, mortality, morbidity, death, and illness among uh, pregnant women and postpartum women and infants. So there are um, a couple of ongoing projects. One is the Safe Sleep Initiative where um, hospital nurseries are monitored to make sure the nurses are giving the instructions to, um, to uh, postpartum women on how the baby should, should be in a crib without any uh, blankets or it's anything. It's on their back, right? Is it, is on their back, yes, back. on their back. 
uh, back to sleep, right? And then another one is called Eat Sleep Console, which is a way that um, to treat babies who've been exposed to narcotics in utero so that they don't have to stay a long time in the hospital withdrawing. But the project I'm doing is a demonstration project at Franklin where we're giving a first aid kit containing naloxone or Narcan as well as um, poison control information, uh, drug uh, recovery information, some band-aids and a digital thermometer to all postpartum women. And we're not asking whether they use drugs, we're not asking what their insurance is, it doesn't show up in the medical record, they're not getting a prescription that they have to then go to the pharmacy. I mean, you know how stressful the yeah. postpartum period is and it's, to add one more thing on top of that is sometimes too much, but this way, we're not asking whether um, people at home use drugs, but it could be a family friend who comes by and overdoses. It could be a child who gets into the medication. So part of uh, the governor's uh, initiative for opioids and Gordon Smith, who's her uh, coordinator, is to get more naloxone, more Narcan into the community. And this is a way to do that. And Narcan, we should say, reverses the effect on breathing of uh, narcotics. So let's just talk about Narcan a little bit. No, sure. so, so if I overdosed here and I stopped breathing, you can put, it squeeze it, it in the squeeze nose. It squeeze it in your nose and it would bring you around. And it, it, it how does it counteract the, the heroin? Um, or the, well, the, the opioids bond to certain receptors in your brain. Um, and what it does is it kicks the okay. narcotic off of those receptors and um, uh, reverses the effects. Wow. Now that's, that's one part of the project. The other part of the project is we know that all of us have what's called implicit bias. That is the way we feel about people who use drugs, use alcohol, whatever. And we know in a healthcare setting that people who use drugs can perceive that, can tell if the nursing staff and the physicians, midwives, are looking down upon them, uh, are looking down on them because they use drugs. And that often keeps people from getting the health care they need. So part two of this project is, is uh, a set of videos that deal with implicit bias and with harm reduction as well. And if you want, we can yeah, talk yeah, more about harm reduction. Yeah, let's talk about harm reduction. But let's go back just to the, the, what you just said. So I've come in, uh, had a, my baby, or if I do that one, you're not going to make a lot of money. But anyway, someone will make a lot of money yeah. if you have a baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they have a baby, and as they're leaving the hospital, you're giving them this kit that's got a little bit of everything in them yep. with some instructions on what they need to do. And it doesn't matter whether the person's come in addicted or not. You're treating all of the women the same Correct. and giving that. So Correct. the idea, as for Gordon's idea, for others, is that we're going to get this out in the community because you never know. I might have it in my glove compartment and come up on a scene where somebody's right. laying there and I can help that person out if I need to. I don't have to go to the drugstore to get it. Nope. Uh, all the enigma that might be attached to this of having that in my possession is, is right. I That's don't right. have to worry about that. That's I don't right. have to wait in line. That's right. It's an interesting idea. How has it been, so let's just leave with that first. How has that been received by the, the patient, by the, the mother? So, so far, uh, we, I mean, we just started doing it in May. It took us over a year to do all the preparation. The first, a month, I think two-thirds two of women, 84% of women took the first aid kit, two-thirds of those took it with the naloxone. So far, I have to pick up the sheets from this month, but 84% um, of the women took the, uh, the naloxone home. So that's, that's pretty good. So I'm, some of them, they, they may have taken the kit and taken the naloxone. That's right, you yeah. can take the kit with the thermometer and band-aids and things and not take the naloxone. But 84% of them took the naloxone as well. And when you give them the commit kit, how do you, is, it, is this the videos that we're gonna talk about or how do you train them with the kit? So the, the nursing staff has watched the videos about harm reduction and implicit bias and a video about how to, to teach people how to use naloxone. So it's the nurses on OB um, who actually do the teaching before the before they go uh, discharge. Home. And I have to put a plug in. The uh, OB medical staff has been terrific. The OB nursing staff has been beyond terrific. Um, we got a small grant from the uh, Maine Health Access Foundation, a uh, very small grant. Um, and we get our naloxone from Maine General, who's the local distributor. And the kits uh, themselves come from uh, 
Healthy Community Coalition as part of their big grant. Wow. So we've had a lot of support, and uh, everyone has really been um, on board. And, and it's our hope that if we're successful, if we can, say, have six months of good result, that we can expand this to other hospitals in the state. You don't have a tracking mechanism, though, that if they use, it, use the product, you don't know if they've used it or not. You just know that it's safe, so they don't report back in that's, any way. That's correct. Again, that would that would interfere with the anonymity of, right, of the right, whole thing. Right, right. So, tell me about harm reduction. So, well, first of all, let's take the time machine back to the 1970s and the war on drugs. I kind of remember the 70s, <laughs> not well, but I remember yeah. you and I were about the same. Right. You, you, you were there. You, you I were, was there. We were. But, <laughs> But, uh, you know, Richard Nixon declared war on drugs. Well, that was 50 years ago, and we see how well that's done, right? It's worse than ever. Uh, and so just say no doesn't work. War on drugs didn't work. Um, and so har what harm reduction is is a way to meet people where they are, to not say you've got to give up drugs, you've got to give up alcohol, whatever, uh, before we'll talk to you before we'll treat you. Otherwise, we'll put you in jail for having a couple joints or something, which is back in the 70s what used to happen. Still um, happens in some states. Still happens, yeah. that's right. And it doesn't work. So harm reduction says we will try to keep you alive until such time as you decide that you want to get off uh, drugs. And we'll give you, we'll provide access to recovery resources to um, detox, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not going to arrest you. We're not going to throw you in jail. We're just trying to keep you alive. And there are a lot of people out there who are using drugs who we don't know about, who are living a normal, life, normal yeah. relatively like a normal life. Alcoholic and, and same thing with alcohol. There's no difference. Um, so again, the, the, the focus is on not blaming people. No one no one wakes up one morning and says, oh, today I'm going to become a heroin addict. No one says, today I'm going to become an alcoholic. There are many pathways toward that. And what we're trying to do is just keep people alive. So that at some point they might recognize that, listen, I can't live my life this way. That's I mean, right. That was one of the things back in, when I was in the legislature about Medicaid expansion and why the county uh, sheriffs supported what I was doing. And Jack Peck did because... They were dealing with a group of clientele that basically were drug addicts, came into the jail system, in many cases dried out, cleaned up, but as soon as they walked out the door, the friend picked them up at the uh, jail with a six pack and a bunch of joints. Right. And because they had no other place to go. They did not right. have the funds to go and say, okay, I've cleaned myself up, I do want to straighten myself out or I want to do something different with my life. Who do I go to counseling with? Who do I go to talk to? They had nothing to do that with. And right. so that's where that money becomes effective because that's why I try to argue that you save money doing this because guess what? If you don't, a person's going to end up back in jail or he's going to get in the hospital and you right. and I are going to pay for it. Right. So take that cost out of it. You now really have saved money. And that's kind of what you're talking about that's is right. changing the behavior of the person. And it's, it's very frustrating for hospital personnel EMTs, oh, it's okay. very frustrating for law enforcement because often they go to the same place and resuscitate the same person or group of people over and over again. But again, what are you doing by throwing people in jail? You, maybe they'll dry them out, clean them up, send them back to the same. In, unless people are, are ready, it's just a um, vicious cycle. Yeah, and and I, you know if you watch the one commercial that's on TV, it's of this young woman who took, said talked to me seven times right. before I walked out of it. And now she's in a, in the community as a productive citizen, uh, got a family, and and has really moved on with her life. But it took her that long to kind of sort it all out. Wow, well, pretty pretty Im impressive to try to make a difference in that stuff. Yeah, and it, and if we can um, get this statewide, it's going to take more grant money than what we have, but um, other hospitals have expressed interest, especially nursing staff, because they see people and they, they're the ones who are face to face and uh, they'd like to know a way forward and a way they can help support people who, who use drugs and not 
be in the blame business. So, and, and this is something I can remember back when the kids were in school, they all had got to take on their little babies. And you did have one that, well, what, you didn't have it, the school had one that was a baby that had come out that was addicted. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're not, this is not really dealing with that, but hopefully dealing with the mother that's there. But right. for that child that's born, they have horrible symptoms they go through. Yeah, and this other project, this Eat Sleep Console project, dealt with that. It Previously, um, you would keep these babies in the hospital for a couple of weeks. You would keep them on morphine or whatever to, to ease their withdrawal symptoms and then gradually wean them from it. Um, this Eat Sleep Console uh, program is a quicker way to get babies out of the hospital to keep families involved and you know when you've got uh, a family who's addicted to drugs in the hospital taking care of a newborn you've got an opportunity to teach them the right way to take care of newborn and to deal with the the stresses of of having a, a new baby at home so their target of opportunity for education this way the baby is getting out sooner and there's a, there's more of a support uh, network for that baby and for that family. Does that baby end up being, it's just a little off the subject, but I got I'm curious, addicted for life or are they, do they can have a normal life when they go back or when you wean them off? Or? Yeah, a lot of the discussion about babies had to do with crack babies. And um, I guess even those babies seem to be doing pretty well later on. But babies who come out addicted to opioids, um, once they're weaned, they do they do fine. Oh, they do fine. As, assuming that they're in a and good family, family, supportive family, et cetera. But you know, the the um, there is a genetic component to people who become addicted and people who become alcohol uh, addicted to alcohol as well. And so, you know, there there are people who are more uh, susceptible to that, given the s same set of circumstances as other people. Now, there seems to be some controversy around this project. Is there or is there not? Are people pretty well accepted what's going on? Um, when we started out, there was some uh, controversy, uh, some suggestions that people who use drugs shouldn't get pregnant in the first place. And that sort of reminds me of the, if you, don't give, if you don't let teenagers have birth control, they won't have sex, okay? You, they will, but the, the consequences will be there. Um, there was a lot of expression about uh, support for the project, but um, saying how sad it was that it was needed. And I can certainly agree with that. You know, we, um, it's a terrible problem. And it's not that it hasn't always been there, but we certainly are focusing more attention on it than we were before. Yeah, I mean, I think that's some of the people I talk to, the difficulty is with is if they're addicted, why are we trying to help them? Because we can't. They, seven times or five times, it says they keep relapsing. We keep saving them, and they go back to their yep. to their other place. I mean, that's I'm sure is the frustration of the docs at the hospital. It says, you know, I already took care of Tom once. I already took care of him twice. <laughs> right, right. I already took care of him three times. When is he going to learn? And and you hit on really a part of it that it's genetics. It's just I don't have the ability to sort out the difference right now. Right, although that's not an excuse, yeah, it, it's, it, it is a, a factor. And to be frank, a fair amount of the current uh, opioid crisis has to do with uh, overprescribing of opioids. And um, we were told uh, that pain is a vital sign and that people shouldn't have pain. So any pain should be treated, and the best way to treat it is with opioids. Um, and a lot of people got addicted to prescription painkillers because we're trying to get rid of pain. Now, you know, and, and those prescription painkillers were heavily marketed by the drug companies. Um, I'm happy to say I never wrote an OxyContin prescription in my career. Good for you. But plenty of people did. And especially I hear a lot of people who got addicted in the military. They were injured. You know, here's a handful of of narcotics, go back, you know, resume your duty, and um, and got addicted that way. And when the, you know, we, we sort of shut off the supply of prescription painkillers with the, the, um, uh, the drug, uh, with the laws, laws yeah. et cetera, um, and that just 
took people over to the dark side. <laughs> yeah, so, and then heroin became, or even if we shut it off, the, the supply was so reduced, the price skyrocketed. And heroin, which has been with us for, you know, what right. was the movie that uh, Paul Newman was in? Was that The Golden Arm? Yeah, that yeah. was that Man was with back the in the arm, Man yeah. with the Golden Arm, which all dealt with heroin, heroin yep. addiction, which was back in the fifties. Oh yeah, heroin's it's been, been around. around so, so it, it's, it's the turn around. of the century. Yeah, so it's turned around. So now they've turned around and and it becomes the cheap alternative for them. Right, and, and it's available on the street. Well, and then fentanyl became even cheaper. I mean, you could take a pound of fentanyl and overdose everyone in Bangor. Oh, jeez. You know, it, it's and it pound that doesn't take up much space. It's easy to bring into the country. Um, so it's it's a it's a big problem. We're just trying to scratch the surface of it and keep people alive. So how how w you measure the success of this program? Because you you, you don't obviously don't know whether they use it or <clears throat> not. Right. So how what what metric did you have to put into place to say it was successful? I think we're successful if people accept it and take it home. Um, it would be nice if someone came back and said, you know, I saved my neighbor's life or my sister or my boyfriend or whatever. Um, we're not expecting that kind of feedback, though. But what we want is to make normative, that is, um, just a routine to if, take naloxone home with you, take naloxone home with you, keep it in your glove compartment, keep it at home. It's part of a first aid kit, just like a Band-Aid or... A, so, you know, anything else, um, and just get it out there in the community. Now, you did, before I, and I made you change the subject, you started to talk about the videos you show. Oh, sure. So, so we should go back to that, because I just remembered that as you're talking about the education right. part. So we partnered with a gentleman named Eric Harum, who's a, a well-known drug counselor and uh, does consultation for a lot of different places. And we put together three videos. So one video uh, was an introduction to the project. Uh, second video was an uh, introduction to harm reduction and uh, implicit bias and how to recognize uh, bias in yourself and to, and to deal with that. And then the third video was an instructional video about how to use Narcan. And they're up on the hospital uh, net learning site. Uh, so all the OB providers and, and nursing staff had to watch these videos. And then uh, every new hire for the OB department or PEDS department uh, watches the videos as well. How about the patient? Do, do they watch? The, no, they're more they're more, more oriented toward the um, medical side. How to take care of people who are uh, who use drugs and how to recognize the bias that you carry in yourself because okay. we all we yeah. all do. No, you and I aren't. No, no. I, 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 I have nothing against bow ties. And I have nothing against people that are small in stature. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I, something I'd like, I'd like to see that video, just for my own education. I'd like to see it all three. I'll have to come by. Hospitals. I have them on yeah. my computer. I'll send them yeah, to you. send them to me. I'm, I'm serious. I think they would be really interesting yeah. to watch. Yeah. I mean, do we ever get rid of this scourge? No. 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 I think that's what people, people got to realize. I mean, what, what was the first thing that Noah did after uh, they planted grapes? Is he got drunk. <laughs> Right? Good man. So, I mean, you, you know, the, the knowledge of, of abuse of substances has been around for thousands of years. And um, uh, we're just trying to, A, keep people alive and keep them productive. How do you move this concept, let's say somebody like me? Suppose that I wanted to, because I'm all around, as you well know, and I wanted to have some Narcan in my car just mm -hmm. in case I run. How would I, is there a way that I could do that? So there's a law that allows pharmacists to dispense uh, naloxone, Narcan, without a prescription. So you can go to the pharmacy and say, can I have some naloxone? And I, they'll give it to me or sell it. To, will they give it to me or sell it to me? Do you know? I don't know. Oh, I, I thought maybe Janet bought it all for us. <laughs> I don't know. You, you, Gordon's in charge of that. <laughs> Yeah, too bad George wasn't around. We could have made him ask Gordon for us. Yeah, really. Uh, that's and, and and Gordon still Gordon Smith is still being the kind of the court. So, uh, let me step back. This project, just a pilot project now at Franklin, is mm -hmm. that correct? That's correct. So, what's the hope of being able to expand it? Well, we've applied uh, for a grant, a bigger grant from the state, to um, to to expand it to other hospitals. We actually put together a toolkit an online toolkit that uh, hospitals can use if they want to um, uh, to start a project like this. 
Because this is through the PQC for me, and we're part of the Northern New England Perinatal Quality Improvement Network, NIPQIN. Okay. All the data that I get about how many doses we're giving out, et cetera, gets put on the NIPQIN uh, website uh, and is accessible. It's all anonymous, but it's accessible by NIPQIN members to see uh, how we're doing. So eventually the whole toolkit will be online. Hospitals that want to do this on their own will be able to do it. And there's check boxes and the, and the videos will be available. Wow. So it's going to grow out of here and spread out. Have you had any hospitals that have reached out to you already to talk yeah, about it? Yes. Uh, Midcoast Hospital is interested. Uh, Penn Bay has been interested. Uh, we were going to, there are five independent hospitals uh, up north and down east that we were originally going to, to start the project with, but we couldn't get enough funding to do that, which is uh, why we chose Franklin. And, and because I practice there, I know the people. And uh, I have to say everyone from... Uh, from Trampas, such as the the CEO on down, uh, been very supportive. It's a great. I mean, I I like the idea. I like the idea that you're educating them as to what the impacts are, and not asking any questions. Right. Do, are those that don't take it? Do they? Do you ask them why? Do you, yes. Do you, yeah. So, what, so what are some of the reasons? Well, one person um, uh, has a spouse in law enforcement and had resuscitated many people and. Um, didn't feel like they needed it. Um, other people said, I, I just never used this. Uh, another person said, I wish I'd had it when my friend overdosed. So, um, and I, I really, we didn't know what the percentage of people who yeah. were going to uh, take it was. I'm, I'm pleased, I don't know, surprised, but I'm very pleased that the percentage is so high. Yeah. yeah uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with the way the nurses present it. And they're, they're your main contact. I was going to say, when you said at the beginning they've been outstanding, it doesn't surprise me because they're no. the ones that, I'm the patient, I trust them. Right. You know, and, and they're, they're the ones who spend the time. You know, the doctor comes in, I have yeah, 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 yeah. uh, But it's a nurse who's really doing the bedside uh, teaching. And, and, and gets them prepared to go home. And do you have a way that you follow up with them in any way or you're not allowed to from a patient standpoint? Um, we don't have a way. And again, we want to, Make it totally uh, anonymous. So your success is measured by how many people take it home, which yes. is a good measurement. The percentage. I mean, you know, if you found out that nobody was interested, it would say that. The, right. The, then we'd have to, <laughs> to go back to square one. Square one. Any idea about when that might be expanded to more patients? So, so let's suppose that I go in there and I have an appendectomy or right. I have a, yeah. a, a bad reaction to something um, to, to expand it to that concept. We've talked about it, and it's a good idea. And... Um, you know, we're only a couple months into this now, but that's sort of a, a way to branch it out uh, within the hospital. I know uh, that nursing administration is very supportive and probably would be supportive of that. I know that both uh, uh, the director of nurses and uh, uh, the nurse manager on the med surge floor have been very interested in the project. Because that would be all a place that you really could get it into the community by being yep. because a number yeah, of patients. Yeah, even more that, day surgery. Yeah. People go home with narcotics. Their kid could get into it. Yeah. Um, uh, and the, the med surge unit. I mean, I, when I get the prescription for those, I never fill it. Yeah. I just don't fill it. Or, or if it's anything to do with my teeth, I fill it, but it sits in the thing because right. I know what can happen if, if I do get some problem there. It yeah. can be extremely yeah. painful, but usually... It sits on the shelf, and I never touch it. Yeah, it it doesn't make me feel good when I've had a, yeah. um, a, a Percocet or something. It just yeah. And, and at the end of the day, some of the things we did, and I know when I was in the legislature with George, uh, with George, with Gordon, is we limited the uh, do the amount in the dosage. Yes. So the dosage can't be above 100, 100 milligrams, I believe, because right. it's no real evidence that if you're above that, it does anything different. Right. Well, I remember right. the phone calls I got about that. People yeah. were mad. And, well, and you know, with chronic pain, narcotics don't work very well because what happens is that the distress you have when you don't take your narcotic is more withdrawal than the actual pain that you were originally treated for. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's very frustrating for people who have pain. It's very frustrating for providers um, uh, because We've all been sort of brainwashed that here, take a yeah, take a Percocet, you'll be fine. 
So we're about we've got a minute left. What message would you like to send to the community right now to end this uh, little conversation we've had? So I'd like to say to the community that uh, people who use drugs aren't don't have a moral failure. They have a chronic illness like diabetes, like hypertension, um, and that treating it treating drug use like a moral failure is not productive. You wouldn't take away a diabetic's insulin. You wouldn't take away a hypertensive's uh, medication. We need to feel the same way about people who use drugs. That's a great way to end it because it's true. We need to treat them the same as we treat everybody else and try to give them the help or keep them so they can function in the community. Right. Jay, thanks. Tom, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to have you come in. Uh, that was a great, great uh, segment, and I hope you all watch it. And if you have any questions, you probably can give Jay a call. <laughs> um, call the hospital, they can help you out better. <laughs> we'll see you next time on Talk in Maine with the Bowtie Boy. Thank you very much.